This is Jack O'Halloran from Superman 1 and 2. And I'm here on FaceTime with Todd Wharton. Enjoy the show. So we all love our superheroes. We love our Iron Man, Superman, Spider-Man, and so on and so on. Well, now it's time for the adventures of Dumbass Man. I'll be right on it, Chief. Rock this monster. Sounds like trouble. Oh, damn. I love the clothes like a monster. Faster than the speeding bullet. They shoot him! They shoot him! More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird! It's a tree! It's Dumbass Man! Oh my god! We'll be right back with Jack O'Halloran. Welcome back to the show, everyone. So my guest tonight is a former boxer turned Hollywood actor. You guys all know him in Superman 1 and 2. You know him from Dragnet. You also know him from the Troll World Chronicles. And of course, King Kong. But you know what? Let's take a look at the clip. So why don't you talk to us? <laughs> Listen, you public My attorney's on his way. We both know I'll be out of here in 20 minutes on bail. So take off these cuffs and open the door. I wouldn't worry about the door, Muzz. The kind of scum who'd represent you would just ooze right under it. Look, Joe, uh, why don't you go get a couple of cups of coffee? I know I could use one. You want anything, Muzz? Chewing gum, a Snickers bar, and my attorney badge kisser. Just you and me, your balls, and this drawer. Ah! Why don't you make it easy on yourself and lead us to the stolen magazines? Jump on this and spin, cop. I'm not saying another word until my attorney gets here. Say, Joe, wouldn't a couple of danishes go great with this coffee right now? I ask you now to pronounce judgment on this, this mindless apparition whose only means of expression are wanton violence and destruction. He is just one, or you are three. Four, if you count him twice. I'm doing the best I can, whatever they'll let me get away with. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Jack, you're doing a lot of stuff out, man, out there in, uh, on the West Coast, man. And you are a busy man. And that's why uh, we'll get into some of your past. But I definitely want to talk about some of the things that you're doing now. So you're doing a lot of great stuff right off the bat. Let's talk about the studio that you guys are building right now, because it's not just a studio. You're really adding something really cool. It's going to help out a lot of people. Talk about that. Well, we're putting a 4 million square foot studio in Nevada, and for mm -hmm. the first time, everything will be under one roof. So you wow. won't have to go trolling all around town, across town, uptown. You know, and then we're putting a smart city next to it that will house 30,000 people, all employees of the studio. So they only have 15 minutes to travel to work. As it is today, you know, if you're even for where I live, 
if I'm doing something at Warner Brothers, it's an hour and a half travel one way going back and forth. So you're three hours in a day. You have technicians that live east of L.A., and they're traveling two hours a day each way, four hours out of their day. And by the time they get to work, it's frazzled from all the traffic. So we're making everything cost effective. And to put wow. everything under one roof is the first time it's ever been done to, to service film, television, databases, streaming, music. You know, it'll all be there. You only have to walk 100 yards to get to whatever you're doing. That's All the cool. editing bays will be there. It's uh, it's it's great. It's going to be terrific, actually. Have you guys started groundbreaking on this thing? Is it still in blueprint? It's it'll brown break probably in thirty days. Oh wow! Because, Congratulations, uh, man. Yeah, you know the the problem was the pandemic slowed us for a year, but that's pretty much straightened out now. So we're uh, putting the final pieces together, and and it's going to be uh, it's going to be great for the state of Nevada. Mm -hmm. You know the industry will move to Nevada, right. and you know it's. Uh, you know, imagine being you only have to go fifteen minutes to work. It's going to be less strain. People will be able when they get to work, they can pay attention to what they're doing, mm -hmm. which makes it cost effective to do product. So, yeah, we're looking forward to it. And it's not that far from Hollywood as well, since in Nevada. I mean, yeah, it's a little plane, but I mean, it's one thirty, mile, 30, 30 it's minute great. drive. It's a thirty minute plane ride. Yeah, I mean that's perfect, man. And and you know what the great thing about this? You know, you guys get to boost up sales in casinos as well by being right over there. I mean, well, that's going to be yeah, like it's, uh, it, it, it's, it'll help the it'll help the state of Nevada tremendously. Mm -hmm. With you your job, you're gonna, huh? what was I'm sorry, guys. All the jobs that you're going to be putting there, you, know, you 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 have a whole host of people making six digits a year, you know, which is uh, not too bad to bring that many jobs of that magnitude in. I think I think that I think people um, will appreciate you for that. I think so. Now, um, when is the? Uh, do you have an idea of date that they're looking to really open this thing? The red ribbon it'll cutting. Us, the, the day we break ground, it'll take us two years to build. Because wow. we're building it with industrial hemp, which is a material that you can build much faster with, and it's a much better material to build with. Oh, that's so great. It, uh, there's so many components to it that are the beneficial that it's amazing. Wow. So how long has this process been going on for, from the thought process all the way to in 30 days? What kind of... Uh, well, you started 10 years ago. Well, we started actually more than that. We were going to build a studio in Long Beach in California here. And financially, in, that, in 208, the world fell apart. Right. And so that, you know, that hindered that. And, and, and almost better because what we're going to do in Nevada is four times the size, you know. And the way things are going in California, it's better to be in Nevada anyway. So mm -hmm. it's just, uh, just a lot of benefits. And, you know, and as you, as we thought about it and, and watched all the things that are transpiring with all the major studios, you know, it's, it makes sense to put everything under one roof and have everything within arm's length of, of what people need. So you, you're taking the cost effectiveness is phenomenal, you know, for what right. you're spending on films and what you're taking. So it's the whole thing. When you, and we have a 45% tax deal, which is going to be terrific. Oh, that's great, man! You guys should uh, you guys should add a talk show to your studio. <laughs> no, I, <was> like, <laughs> I wouldn't be amazed if there wouldn't be one pop up there. Don't worry about it. No, I'm just by. I'm going to be out in Cali in, in in the end of August. I'm telling everybody that, so I'm looking to hook up with everybody once I'm out there. Just to give some love because I'm COVID affected, man. I'm good to go, so I can give some love. <laughs> You know, but listen, first of all, Jack, congratulations, man. I love the fact that it's been 10 years. And the reason why I'm saying that, um, here we had the Universal Hip Hop Museum that just broke around. It's kind of like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for Hip Hop. But that also took 10 years from the thought process today. You know what that means? It means the people involved, just like you, really, really were passionate and really cared about this project. Because 
Most people have ideas and they try them out and then it just goes because they realize, oh my God, this is going to take forever. Listen, any great idea does take a long time, but once you get it going, it's worth it. And you do well, we put a lot of study into this, you know, we wanted to make it, you know, we wanted to, you know, when you're in the, I've been in the industry 45 years mm. and I've watched a lot of things, you know, that should have been done that weren't done. Right. And, and it's, uh, and it's sad, you know, and you, you have, uh, a lot of the major studios now are owned by large conglomerates. It's a whole different, uh, whole different kettle of fish. And, you know, they just, uh, it's, it's not, you don't have the creative, creative minds. That's why there's so many independent production companies now. Yeah, it's crazy. Now, what is going to be your role in this thing? You going to be one of the executive directors of the studio, or I'll be on the board. You know, uh, I have a partner, Jay Samet, mm -hmm. who's uh, very established in in the studio running and stuff. Who will run the place day to day, and we'll put a board of people together that will be suffice it for what we need to do. That's and true. we'll have, uh, you know, it's 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 going to be run by people that really know what this film industry is about. Oh, of course. And, and put some creativity back into it. It's, you know, it's not, it's, 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 it's going to shock a lot of people. Let me tell you that. That's great, man. How many people you already have hitting you up? Like, Hey Jack, Jack, I got a script. I, I need you guys to take a look at it. And you're, I like, get that all the time. you're like, come on, man. I'm like, we haven't even broke ground yet. You're throwing me scripts. Are you guys crazy? Yeah, but see, it's a different kind of, it's not going to be like a Warner Brothers. It's going to be like a big bar mitzvah hall. Every person that walks in that lot will pay us. You know, it's, okay. it's, you're, you're, you're talking about anything you're doing. If you if you need a, a screw, a screwdriver, or whatever, you, you rent from, we'll have several companies in it that will supply everything. So you mm -hmm. won't have to go across town for nothing. Everything will be right there. All the props, all the wardrobes everything so how many how many lots how many studio lots are you guys going to be building in this thing we got 2500 acres there so we're going to be putting not only just the, the main four million square foot which is huge yeah but the, we're gonna have back lot things there for you know for so people don't have to go on location to be able to come right there and shoot everything they want to shoot and are you guys going to be offering like animatronics, CGI stuff in there as well? Oh yeah, the whole every every bit of technology that you can fathom will be under that roof. Man, that's incredible. And it'll be open to be what's coming because every six months something changes. Yeah. So it'll be wide open for to bring in, but we'll have the ability to do that. That's, that's the phenomenal part. thing. I love it. I love it. Congratulations on that, man. Now, speaking of movies, you're working on a movie right now, I believe, called Red River, and you guys are actually shooting that in Nevada. Well, we're going to be shooting, we'll be shooting it pretty soon over in Nevada. And mm -hmm. great, uh, a great horror film with, with a great Faust twist to it. Different than anything that I've seen in a while. That's the reason why I, I like it a lot. It's, uh, yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun doing it. Are you playing the killer? <laughs> No, I'm playing the river man. I'm playing the lead role, and it's it's uh it's kind of a unique. It's, it's actually a really unique script, and people are going to really like it because it's different. Uh, it's a different kind of horror picture. Right. So this is more yeah, because you know what I'm noticing now. I mean, I mean, me and you grew up on a lot of the older horror films, right? Where it was just like blood and guts and eggshells and ketchup. Yeah, this is different than that. This is going to be different than that. It's more like a thriller, like kind of like giving Harrison Ford a, like a like a horror movie type of thing where it's like more detailed in the script and all that yeah it's a, it's 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 about a river that people go to, to to accomplish their dreams in life you know and wow. and the character that I play I'm the first person that ever came back from this river so wow. the, you and, and it's whether when you get there whether it's worth having all the things that you're looking for whether how real are the things you really are looking for. Yeah. So it's it's going to be, it's, it's an interesting uh, cast of people that, that want their ultimate dreams satisfied. Musicians, okay. different people, you know? And so what's going to sacrifice to get it? 
It's quite a, yeah, it's quite an interesting, it really has a great Faust twist to it. I yeah, I like that because how many times that people over the years have gone up to you, me, and are always like, would you do this for $10 million? Like one of those type of things. And then you got to sit there and think about it. Like, would I do that? And it's usually the craziest stuff. So I'm assuming this film was kind of leading like in. Selling, like selling your soul to the devil, you know what I mean? Pretty much, yeah. That This sounds like right up there with Quentin Tarantino, like the perfect film for him to direct. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, it's, kind of, it's one of his kind of pictures, yeah. Oh, that's so, great, man. I'm looking forward to seeing that, and I'm assuming that's not going to come out until 2022, possibly. 22, probably 22, yeah. Probably in the winter, which is which is pretty crazy. Now, you have a lot going on, all right? Um, I don't know where you find all the time. I understand we all went through COVID, but you <laughs> have been doing a lot. You're not only putting one out, you're putting two books out. Like, who has time to even write one book, let alone two? Tell us uh, about the one. The, what, the, 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 the thing that we, what we're doing is Family Legacy, which is going to be a tremendous miniseries that will turn into a fantastic series. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it'll make Boardwalk Empire and uh, Sopranos look like a child's game. We're going to really... Family Legacy, the book, did very well because it, it tells a lot of truth. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna, it's what we're doing. We're telling a lot of truth about what happened in New York, how the heroin business hurt a lot of people, and the, you know different uh, how people were thrown under the bus because of certain things, and the way certain things transpired. So, it's the first book that I wrote was from um, my father's death to the Kennedy assassination, and we tell the truth about it all. Well, so if you don't mind, to some of my viewers, explain briefly if you'd like because i know it's this is a personal thing about who you follow us my father was a man called albert anastasia who uh ran a little company in new york called murder incorporated and he had his own family the fact the anastasia family turned in to be the gambino family right. uh, they assassinated my father in 57 because he wouldn't go in the drug business and he controlled yes, all the ports Right. Genevieve wanted the drug business, and Albert said, yeah, sure. in The Godfather, when they went to Brando for drugs, and he said, if we touch it, our children will touch it, it'll be the downfall of the family. My sure. father said that. My father actually said that. So, it, uh, you know, they, they killed him, and then they tried to kill Frank Costello. They tried to get rid of the people that were adverse to the drug business. And Costello had probably the greatest political book where he had the most contacts politically, and he turned around and said, if we go in this drug business, we're going to lose all our political contacts. Nobody's right. going to want to deal with us. You know, right. gambling gambling and loan sharking was one thing, but, you know, drugs are a whole different kettle of fish. Yeah, and it, it's kind of great that, as a son, you actually didn't go into that line of work and the lifestyle. Was that something that was approached to you when you were a kid, or were you just too young to even realize it? No, I was very much involved for a lot of years, and you know, just uh, it, it just you know, you you sit back and watch the changes that are happening that aren't yep. for the good or aren't for the better. So, a lot of us went legitimate, you know, mm -hmm. totally legitimate, and uh, and and I did that with the film industry, and you know, and it's uh, it's you know, it, it just you take and you learn. You learn a lot of things about life when you're in that world. Oh about yeah, the reality of living and what really, really is real. Oh and yeah, you just take that education, you apply it to what you do in your life, and it, uh, you know, it works out pretty well. Yeah, and I can a little relate to you because I was raised in Long Island. Uh, you smell him. My father wanted to move us out there, but I'm originally from Howard Beach, uh, so that's like got here. Yeah, so that's why um, I'm hearing these stories that he's saying. I'm like, hmm, that sounds familiar. <laughs> You well, know, yeah. a lot of changes, you know, people, uh, a lot of the killings in New York with family to family was over the drug business, and it was kind of oh, stupid. Man. It have yeah. never happened, you know, you had, and it's it, it just, uh, it's time that people tell the truth about what really went down and how it's gone down and, mm -hmm. and where, you know, for our society, it's just, it's, 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 it's something that people really need to know. 
Yeah, and that's the great thing about film. Um, if you get a good director, good actors, and especially a good writer, good screenwriter, you can really predict a great, great story with those tools. I mean, writing alone, we all know is very important in screenplay because, for example, Ocean's Eleven, the original, um, wasn't even written well. It just did decently because of the cast that they had in the original. Yeah, one. great that cast. cast. I mean, Amazing yeah. cast, right? And I forgot who rewrote it, but they saw what they did, and they're like, oh, we got to rewrite this thing because that could really be a good script. So they did the same thing, made it a better script, added a great cast in the new one with George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Don Cheadle, and it did so well. They were able to do sequels to it. And um, well, it's just like you know, the, the, no one has a crystal ball in Hollywood, okay? Yeah. But the one genre that has never ever lost a dime, even the spoofs that they do about the genre make money, and that's organized crime pictures. You know, they just uh, you you have. They did a picture a few years ago about a hit guy that nobody ever heard of, and his son called the road to perdition with uh, tom hanks and uh and uh, I think, yeah uh, what's his name? leonardo DiCaprio. Tom, no leonardo wasn't tom yeah leonardo wasn't tom hanks and and uh, and paul newman had a, a, a role in it and mm -hmm. the picture did a billion dollars yeah you know? but because of, of the storyline but you know the, the godfather there's i could go through a bunch of Organized crime pictures that have made a fortune. You yeah, know, people want to know because, why that is, right? Because well, people, people love violence. They love violence. Well, it's That's not funny. that they. It's not that they so much want violence. You, you're talking about things that people lived with every day. Right. You know, they watch neighborhoods change. They watch things happen in their life. You know, when I wrote my book, you know, uh, there was a man who put a, a on Amazon when they when you know people critique things. And the guy wrote a wrote a thing. He said, you know, finally, you know, he said that, that, that all the things in this book are 90% true because I lived it. I was there. Yeah. And, and now the, all the proper names are being used and things that happened in New York and stuff is all being told for the first time mm -hmm. because the media covers everything up. They don't really tell you what you want to hear. Right. You know, the media yeah. has made the, the news stations are there to make awards. They're not right. there to tell you the truth. So. Well, you want to know something when it comes to organized crime? I mean, let's cut the bull. The media, even though they're the power outlet to tell you what's what, they're also scared, too, because nobody wants to break a story, right, on any organized crime because they're going to become a target. Whether people believe it or not, that's the way a lot of people looked at when they well, first, you know, you know, it front. depends on what you, you know, people said to me, aren't you afraid of writing this? And you're going to put your life in danger. I said, you know, if you have tried, if you have died, I'm still sitting here talking to you. You know, yeah. and I don't worry about that. You know, it's just, just you, you, if you're telling, you're talking about telling the truth about something and, and showing people and, and people have been dying to hear this. They want to know because they lived it. They were there watching it, and they're saying, how come nobody tells us anything? How yeah. come no one has told the truth about certain things? You know, and there's certain historic things that went down in, in, in the history of the country that people should, they deserve to know the truth when they see it, and they know the truth, but then no one ever expands on it. Right. You know, so it's, 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 it's time. Mm -hmm. And that's why social media right now has become a blessing and a curse because when we were growing up, we didn't have social media, right? We didn't have the internet. You know, I didn't get it until I, I think it was in my 30s. Um, and you didn't get it till recently also. Now, you know, truth is out there everywhere. And I think it's easier now for movies to really do truthful movies because you can't hide it anymore. Like, we all knew racism has been around forever and bigotry and you know, women empowerment and all these other rights that people have been fighting for years. Well, the problem you have with social media, problem you have with social media is it takes a lot of things out of content as well, like just right. like the media does. You know, people are, 
are are putting uh, theories on things that uh, aren't really relative. You know, uh, yeah, racism has been there for a long time, but it's actually been handled in in a lot. Of, I mean, I remember when I was a kid. You know, you didn't integrate with this, and you didn't integrate to that. And we had street fights and all that stuff, but yet some of those people were my best friends. Yeah. You know, and, and, and like when I finished boxing, I took a young man uh, from uh, Philadelphia and, and he was a, 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 a hell of a fighter and I made him world champion. And I moved him into my house and people said, my God, you're moving that guy in your house. I said, why not? You know, what, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. he's an athlete and he's a and he's a hell of a person and and he's going to be a world champion and he was a world champion you know well, unfortunately so, a lot of people don't have the attitudes we have towards humans but, and but yeah when i was a kid when i was a kid you would never invite uh, a black person in your house you know and they, and they had what they call jelly glasses if you gave a worker a glass of water it was from a jelly glass i mean the the bigotry was there, but not as exp I mean, it was just a whole different relativity. You know, we played in schoolyards where we played basketball games against each other, football games against each other. Uh, you know, things were a, a much healthier situation. Yeah. You know, there was respect for certain things and athletes that were really athletes. You know, it's a, uh, I, I don't know. I, I just have a whole different concept. I watch all the stuff that they're doing today and and that makes me sick to the way that they blow things way out of proportion, you know. Yeah. And it's uh, and I think it's I think they're taking advantage of something and going way overboard with it. Yeah, like they did with organized crime. They did the same thing, you know. They just when things were going bad, they expanded it worse. Yeah, you know. And my father was the head of a company called Murder Inc., but they killed amongst themselves they policed their own people they didn't kill innocent people yeah they didn't go around yeah, shooting go people around. i mean when i was raised in philadelphia as a kid we we never had drive-by shootings yeah people never locked their front doors because the yeah. neighborhoods were overseen by certain people and you wouldn't yeah. think of committing crimes i mean it's it, like take las vegas take las vegas old las vegas Used to be one way in and one way out. You would not think of committing a crime there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And look at it today. Yeah, you know it's what horrendous. it is? It's because weapons are available to everybody now. You can go on any street corner, ask. You yeah. can go to one person, go to another. Somebody but has why? it. That's the issue. Why? Exactly. Because there are people out there that are evil that want to make money off the deaths of others and that's well, the problem you know, you've got to understand something that there's a lot of people that are guilty in certain ways you know we've had a lot of conflicts from different wars and things and we've manufactured a lot of weapons right and they're sitting around in boxes so they started selling them to people on the street and that because right. of money it's all about money it's always you know? about money. i mean there, there, when i was a kid there was a gun called a glock which was nobody owned it but a policeman. Right. And a Glock was a porcelain gun. Right. You could walk on an airplane with a Glock. Yeah. You know, I can go on any corner in, in, south, in, in the south end of, of L.A. here and buy a Glock every day. And that shouldn't be. No, it's horrible. You know, so it, it's, it's having things available and making right. them available mm -hmm. and allowing them to be available. But yeah, no, you know, where do you where do you draw the line at? Yeah, and that's the issue. It seems like every time a politician comes in, says go to do this, do that, he comes in, and he starts to, but then nothing gets done, and then the next politician comes in, and it's just getting overwhelming. It's like these are those little issues that are big issues, and if they're not handled properly, it gets worse, and that's the Absolutely. scary part. Like we wake up every day and watch the news, and it's just more and more and more. And one of the speeches I did in Times Square, one of the things that drew a lot of attention was, you know, I pretty much said, listen, guys, you know, we have AIDS, cancer, COVID, diabetes. I mean, let's go down the list of all the diseases, right, that all humans are subjected to. 
If we have all these problems already happening, why are we already developing more problems by literally trying to kill each other when we're trying to figure out how well, to... Well, you know, you, you got to sit back and, and take a look. And you look at the AIDS virus was uh, a horrible thing, okay? And when the AIDS it's virus terrible. first came, when it first, when it first rose its head, you know, people say, oh, my God, you can't be in the same room with a person with AIDS. If they breathe on you, you're going to collect it. Or if you shake their hands, you're going to get, well, that's all lies. The only way you can contract AIDS was blood on blood. That's the right. only way you could ever get it. Okay? Now, as bad as the disease of AIDS was, they didn't shut the world down. Right. They didn't have people walking six feet apart. You yeah. understand? And, and you're talking about Big Pharma making a bunch of money. Right. From all the concoctions and stuff that they had. Right. And there was AIDS was created by one guy. Michael Ricana showed him. He was out of San Francisco. He was a lab rat for the government. He created that virus. And he created it so that when they tampered with it, it split a thousand to one. So they had a hell of a time trying to put their fingers on it. Yeah. But he had, there was a cure. And, mm -hmm. and that cure sits off the Isle of China. There's a little island over there. And there's people that have went and been cured of AIDS. Of course. It's a money thing. What a Nobody talks about it. Unfortunately. You, you, can't, you, don't, you don't talk about it. But So what this disease, this thing here, separating people and making people stay apart, you know, it, it, that's, it's like social media to where people are texting each other. Nobody meets each other face to face anymore. Yeah, and me and you had a conversation like that because yeah. one thing I appreciate about me and you is we actually talk on the phone, right? Not emails, no texts. Imagine me trying to teach you how to do some tech. Through it never email. would work. <laughs> you, you, you'll kill it me. Never work. Oh I'm my not, god! I, I'll be the first to tell you. You know, I, I'm not in this techie world. That's that's you know, away from my age bracket. You know, I don't yeah. sit on the phones and. You know, when I was a kid, when we were in the streets, we never used, you know, we used pay phones. Yeah. You, using other phones, you got caught. So we used pay phones and stuff. And phones, to me, are like a taboo. Too many people listen on them. That's right. So to swing backwards a little, um, first of all, I, I have to congratulate you on such an amazing career so far because not only have you been in some great iconic films, you work with Hollywood, some of the best Hollywood has ever put out in terms well, of actors. Worked with some great actors. I mean, done. first of all, we could talk about Christopher Reeve for a moment. Um, he went obviously too young, you know, and uh, he was definitely a leading man, future leading man, I feel, in Hollywood. But you know, it is what it is. You got to play in Superman, which I think Superman, that series, is what really, really started the movement for all superhero films. Well, that was the first superhero movie, movie that was. Uh, you got, you got to understand, that was the first superhero. First American superhero was uh, Superman. And, uh, Superman. And Richard Donner did a tremendous job with it. Uh, Him and Tom Mankiewicz, they lived, eat, and slept it. They do a fantastic job with, and, and Christopher Reeve was a, that was his first movie of really being a movie. That's right. Prior to that, he was he did a couple stage plays and a and a, and a soap opera, you know. He, but and Donner got a performance out. There'll never be another Superman like Christopher, changing yeah, from Clark Kent to Superman. He did yeah, a he did magnificent that. job. But Donner was a great director. I mean, the three villains. All of us had, uh, it was a great cast. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a great crew of people, and it was, it, it just worked, you know. It was a, a great idea that the Salt Kinds come up with, and it worked yeah. really well. I mean, you couldn't, you know, uh, but it, as they got, went down the street and did three, four, you know, it kind of irked me because they got darker and darker and darker. They got away from the all-American way. When we did Superman 1, you didn't see people killing everybody. Right. We, we Christopher arranged where they were locking people up and putting them in jail. Mm -hmm. You know, right. it was the all-American way of life. Mm -hmm. So, 
it's a, we're looking, we have a great script that we're trying to get uh, put back together with Warner Brothers to, to do, uh, to bring Christopher Reed back on the script, the screen again, because we could do it with holograms. And uh, do you think that would all over with the, I mean, if you do something like that, you t you're telling me make another Superman with Christopher Reeve's face? Oh, yeah, I think people will go crazy. They'll love it. It would also change perspective of Hollywood where people would be like, hmm, if we could use non-A actors and put somebody else's face on we could save a lot of money. That's that's a sense that, that a lot of people that, You know, they, they, they talk about that, but that really doesn't work. You know, you have to be... you. you Acting is a funny deal, you know. Yeah. Uh, I was very fortunate. When I first got into business, I had a great mentor, Robert Mitchum. Mm -hmm. And wow. he taught me a lot of things. But one of the things that, that you learn is that the camera either loves you or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Either the camera loves you or you're, you know. And, and like I asked him one time, what is the definition of a star? And he said, it's one word, Jack presence you either have a presence in front of that camera or you don't yeah i'll be yeah. honest with you man i love being behind the camera because i love making people laugh and having a good time and it's well, not you know, everybody there's so many jobs involved it's like a family affair you know yeah and and, it, and it, you know one of the things i working with people like mitchum and brando and Gene Hackman and, yeah. and you know Omar, Omar Sharif was a trip. I loved it. We did a picture called the ball, the Baltimore Bullet. Jimmy yeah. Coburn, Omar Sharif, and you know you, when you work with some of the stalwarts of the industry that really embrace the industry, and 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 they're pros at it. They mm -hmm. don't show up late for work. They're there right on time. They do what they got to do, and and they, you know. But when you you work with people like like Mitch and, and Brando. When they come on the set, you can hear a pin drop. And they say hello to everybody, and they say good night to everybody when they leave. And when we, we did Farewell, My Lovely. If Robert Mitchell made steak for lunch, everybody ate steak. That's the way he was, you know. And, and, like, we had four Oscar winners on our crew. John, John Delonzo won the Oscar for Chinatown, the cinematographer. Dean right. Talavera, the set director, won the Oscar for The Godfather. Mm -hmm. uh, Wes Moores were, were makeup people. Mm -hmm. And the guy did special effects. We had four Oscar winners because of Mitchum. That right. wanted to work with Robert Mitchum, you know. That's why I'm saying and you worked, and they worked with you too, obviously. Every, I think every film you had had an iconic leading men and just a great cast and a great background. And I can't imagine that the film that I think you've had the most fun on, and I'm probably, I could be wrong. In my opinion, by watching it, I would have had a blast to be a part of Dragnet with Dan Aykroyd and Tom. Dragnet was great. I mean, you're talking about laughing all day long. Dan <laughs> Aykroyd, you could, let me tell you something. You could watch Dragnet 50 times and oh, you still it. wouldn't get all the one-liners that Danny Aykroyd threw out in that picture. I mean that was Tom Hanks' breakout picture. We had a lot of fun. It was a, it was a great script. Again, Tom Manker was was involved. It was a great script. We had a great cast, and we had a lot of fun doing it. You know, you yeah. talk about going to you talking about going to work and laughing every day. <laughs> you know, Danny Aykroyd's a funny guy, man. You know. Oh, he is hilarious, and I'm sitting here. I'm like, and you played uh, uh Rhodes. Abel Mose, that's the name. Yeah. Sorry. How many takes did you guys have to do? Because every scene that you guys have together, there were it was pretty much jokes in every scene. Like, how many takes did you have to do sometimes? We didn't do a lot of takes. We did, really? what, 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 yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm a believer in doing one or two, three takes at the most, man. You know, you don't need either you do your job or you don't, you know. Yeah. We did we did a scene in Dragnet where they're interrogating me in the, in the interrogation room. I remember and, that. And, and, and we did that we did that whole sequence very quickly. I mean, it was it just like ran off of everybody's head. It just worked. It worked out really well, you know. Mm -hmm. it just uh, it was a, it was a lot of fun working. Danny's a pro. Danny Danny Aykroyd's a hell of an actor.
Yeah, it was I, great, I, didn't move that one. I love it. Really good time. I had a great time doing that picture. I'll tell I you one thing. I would love to see you, Dan Aykroyd, Bill Murray, and the old cast do one more Ghostbusters. <laughs> I think. Be, think about that. That would be so great. Like they're older, and they yeah, come out of retirement, mm -hmm. and it's like I, I could definitely see you being in the whole nine. I could actually see you playing like a really like scary like ghost but one of the leading roles as it goes, like something powerful, because you're a tall guy. Yeah. Um, I think it would be awesome. <laughs> be I think fun. it would be great. <laughs> sure. Tell that to I the like studio. Danny, 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 Danny's, a couple of years. Danny's a great kid. Danny's you really think? a good kid. And I'll tell you, his sidekick was a hell of a guy, was uh, uh, John Belushi. Oh, the Blues Brothers. Come on. Yeah, Belushi was a great kid. Yeah, and I'll, I, I'll be honest with you, that's somebody else that, I mean, he died in a ski accident, I believe, and uh, he was literally just starting his career with Animal Blue House, Cornell, the Blues John Brothers. Belushi? Yeah, yeah. John, John was the, it was John, sad the way. No, James Belushi. Was it John or James? John Belushi, right? Because James is the brother. Jim Belushi. Of Jim Belushi. Uh, yeah. Jim, Jim? God, I get messed up myself. I get that yeah, messed Jim up Belushi. all the time. <laughs> Jim Belushi. Yeah, he was. A, he was just. He was a really nice guy. I met him several times, and you know, he just he died. Uh, he OD'd, and it was uh, sad. It was really, yeah. really, really sad. It's, it's you know, people get caught up in things, and he got caught up in something, and and they killed him, and it just uh, it was a great, great loss for Hollywood. And he's got his brother. His brother was a pretty good actor, but it wasn't yeah, like he uh, wasn't. He wasn't like uh, Jimmy Belushi was. He was a he was a hell of an actor. Yeah, I mean back then, remember Tommy. when it came to SNL, that was the era of Jim Belushi, Eddie Murphy, Dan Aykroyd. That was when they all started. They came uh, to me. They came to me when I was doing Superman. They wanted me to join that SNL crew. They come over and say, we're putting this television show together. And I said, ah, I said, you know, I don't, I don't like really doing TV. <laughs> I was I was in the films, you know, and I was in the movies. And, and they said, well, yeah, we, we're going to put this funny show together. You should, there's a great role. You could come and do it because, you know, I did a couple of things that were comedic, you know. And it, uh, I should have probably done it, but I, I was working all the time shooting films. And, and when you're right. doing films for three years, like Superman, we worked on, for three years. Mm -hmm. King Kong was nine months, you know. Yeah. A lot of lengthy shoots, so. Oh, yeah. And uh, do you still keep in touch with some of your former actors uh, from some yeah. of these movies? Sure. Oh, man. So they must be excited about what you're doing with Studio City in, in Las Vegas. Oh, sir. yeah. I mean, I talk to Sarah Douglas all the time. Oh, Sarah's yeah. How's she doing, by the way? Huh? How's Sarah doing? Sarah's great. Sarah works all the time. She's a trip. Yeah. I mean, they're all after Sarah and, and the whole group there. Terrence is, Terrence is slowed down quite a bit. Terrence Stamp. But Mark McClure's around. I talk to him all the time. And, and Jeff I'm East. Talking. Jeff East plays young Superman. He's He and I talk all the time. He lives in Paris. But there's a, yeah, it's a. Uh, you know, when you, you when you when you when you do certain things, you 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 create friendships that just never go away. Yeah. Well, I'm honored to uh, know you now because uh, hopefully when I'm out there, because I think you're in Cali, you know, I'm gonna be calling you when I'm flying out there just to say hi. I'm around like a donut. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, my father used to say that, man. <laughs> You know? That's funny, man. I love it. I love it. And uh, even though you're doing all this stuff, have you been um during the COVID? Have you been putting uh, some screenplays together for yourself that when the studio launches that you may bring over to the studio as well? Do you have any ideas? Well, you like know, I said, we're, like, doing, you know. we're doing this. Uh, we're doing Family Legacy as a miniseries, and it'll run into a very lengthy series because we have so much information. To put down that we're going to put out and it's going to it's going to be a lot of fun so that's the thing you're doing in two years that's not starting soon that's something you're doing in two years from now 
Well, the studio it will be take a couple of years, but we'll shoot the pilot for the uh, we'll shoot the pilot for the uh, miniseries right up in New York. And uh, there's places that we can start working. You know, we're we're not going to wait till the uh, till the studio is done before we do it. Wait, wait, when are you coming to New York, man? I, now you're coming into my hood. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, New York was my hood way before it was yours, so. Let me tell you something, man. New York is my hood. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My father was New York. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> Albert was New York. Oh, my God, man. This is great, man. I'm, I'm just so happy for you. And I love the movies, like I said. Now, the one thing I never really got to watch, I mean, you did Dragnet, King Kong, Jeff Bridges, Jessica Lyon, Superman's 1 and 2. I, did you actually ever get to meet um, Richard Pryor, who's on Superman 3? Did you ever get Richard to meet him? Richard and I, we, 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 you know, they, it was one of the things that I wish I hadn't turned down. They, I was doing King Kong, and we had a six-week break while they went to New York to film the end of the film. And uh, they came to me, Paramount came to me to do a picture called Silver Streak with Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder. Oh, and I yeah. should have done it. I should have done it. It was one of the, because it would have been a lot of fun working with both of them. But I, uh, you know, I just, I was, I, I was very, I didn't want to get into doing big dumb guys, you know. I, I thought there was better things to do. Like I have a script that I'm getting ready, I want to do also. It's an Irish picture called A Ballad of a Simple Man, which was the original Informer, which was a classic done in the 30s with John Ford and mm -hmm. Victor McLaughlin. Yeah. And we took the book and we did another version of the book, which is really quite good. And we're and I've owned it for like forty years. And I wrote it when I was when I was doing King Kong. And I've turned down four or five different productions that wanted to do it because I want to make sure it's done right. Because it's a great script. So we're getting we're gonna wind up doing that in Ireland in the next we'll have it pretty much set up in the next year. That's crazy. And I'm glad you just brought something up because I wanted to ask you that. Because this happens when you mentioned the uh, the Mafia movies. One of my really good friends, and I actually just did a funny skit with him called Mafia e Mazia. It's on my Instagram. It's one of my joke promos. Is Victor Calicchio, who wrote Summer of Sam. And one of the things he told me was like, Italian actors always get typecast as tough guys and Mafia roles. Now, for you, since you're a tall guy and you have a certain look about you and you're a great guy, did you find yourself getting typecast a lot based on your height? Well, that they were, they, that's, what they, that's the, like, I, I, I tell you, I turned down six movies and Richard Kyle, Richard Keel did them all and made his career. Richard Keel did Silver Streak. He did, you know, he did. Uh, uh, he did James Bond, correct? Did the Bond movies. I turned the Bond Yeah, movies. he was the guy with the yeah. silver teeth. He was yeah. called Teeth. Dark right. or something like that. Yeah. And you yeah. get confused with him too, right? People well, confuse they, you with people, him. Yeah, people say, but he, Richard was, you know, I, I turned the movie down because I, I, first of all, I was I was doing a picture called March or Die. And for March or Die, we went right into Superman. And, and I just didn't like the character in the Bond movie. You know, yeah. and I, I, I was with Mitchum. When they get, Cubby Broccoli came to L.A. to try to talk me into doing the picture, and I just signed to do March or Die with Gene Hackman. And uh, Mitchum said, do you like the script? I said, no. I, no. He said, then, what, then don't do it. You know, uh, a lot of maybe being young in the business and all, people grab at everything, you know. But I was very choosy about what I did. So I don't feel I've ever done a bad film, to be honest with you. Yeah, because I liked yeah, all the scripts that I did. Yeah, you know? and you can never regret like I should have did this, should have did that. No, I don't. It's yesterday's newspaper. No. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like it was a great film, right? And 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 they were, but you know what? The way you do it, that's it's just meant to be because you probably get so many scripts. You, like you said in Hollywood, you can't predict what's going to be like great. You, it's impossible. You can't do it. You well, can have to catch your own. I did a picture with Chuck Norris called Hero in the Terror, which uh, was a, was a, a I played this real crazed killer guy, and uh, and I <laughs> and I remember uh, uh, so 
somebody being on the set when I was down there doing the, a shot and the, I walked up the ramp and turned around and came down into the shot and the person said, oh my God, you're, you're like a whole different person. I said, well, that's what acting's all about. You know, you're a <laughs> character and you do it. But it's, uh, the picture worked extremely well. I mean, it was one of the best things Chuck ever did. The yeah. picture worked well. They just didn't, the distributors didn't have the money to distribute it properly, unfortunately, but it's played well all over the place, you know, like on HBO and all that stuff. They are all the streaming that they do today, you know, so it's, but you know, I, I had a lot of fun with everything that I did. Chuck was yeah. a great guy to work with. We had a lot of fun. We, you know, it, uh, it, it just, you, you, you do things that you want to do mm -hmm. that you feel and you want to do. Cause that, that way you're doing the best you can. You know? Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. Well, let me tell you something, man. 45 years in Hollywood, had an incredible run, and you're still going strong with a lot of great things coming up between the two books. And, of course, this studio. I mean, I, I, I love when people take their experience and say, you know what? Let, let's do this. Let's let's help people out. Let's get more jobs going. Let's build something new. Let's. That's, you know, that's what the studio is going to do. The studio is going to revolutionize the industry. Yeah, and I love and I love how to, you're going to give independent filmmakers the opportunity to be able to use this stuff. Obviously, they have to have a budget, but well, you won't be you won't have to go on location. Everything is there. We're we're going to add this LED LED stuff, and the LED LED was a concept that we had when we did Superman. Yeah, we actually they, they call it Zorm's optic vision at the time, mm -hmm. and we had this huge seventy foot screen with two with three pole arms come out of it mm. and body molds on the end of it. And we laid in the body mold 70 feet up off the ground and they shot us into the film. So when you see the fight scenes in Superman, you know, we're flying under bridges around buildings. People say, wow, man, that's what made the film so exciting. Yeah. All the stuff time. that we did, you know, there was no wires, you know, there was no CGI. That was actual film on film. We shot yeah. all that. You know, yeah. it took a period of time to do it, but it was well worth it. It came out brilliantly. Oh, it was great the way you guys flew. And, you and I mean, today, obviously, it's much different, but what you guys had access to back then and the way you did it, oh, it looked, it looked awesome. I yeah, loved it. Yeah, it came out really well. I mean, it's a, I mean, the people, young kids watch that film today, and it's like it was just made. It just, it's that, you know, 40 some years later, it's still a stalwart film, you know? Which you is kind of cool. You know what? Uh, after we get off this, I'm going to do a little editing, but I'm going to look for Superman because you make me want to watch it now. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> man. You I want to watch the Donner it. Cut. The Donner Cut's really good. Yeah, Superman I mean, I love them all. Yeah, I love them all. One, two, and three. I mean, I like three because Richard Pryor had a little comedic thing to it. The, the plot of it wasn't that great. I, I wasn't a no, fan of the film with Robot and the whole like. It, was, it was, I didn't like. I liked that Richard Pryor was in it because I'll be honest with you, Richard Pryor wasn't in it. I don't think that movie would even did decent at all because I think he just brought a comedic sense to the movie, something different. But the whole robot thing and it turned into this, and you know, even Sarah Douglas, it was just it, the whole thing was just weird and. Um, yeah, I like one and two. <laughs> we're gonna keep it. Like that. They've upheld for forty some years. It's you know, I mean, I I remember the first Comic Con I ever went to after we did Superman, and and a, and a kid come up to me and said, "My God, you can actually talk." <laughs> you know? He said, "You actually can speak." I said, "Wow, man." Yeah. All right. Is that my agent calling? Nah, that's, I don't know. that's my agent, man, because he knows not to call me while I'm live. So he was calling you and be like, yo, can you tell Todd to uh, hurry up? <laughs> I, to I, got a, I got a movie I got to throw at him. I'm like, right. <laughs> people, agents, man, they pain in my ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack, listen, um, it, it's been great, man. It's about that time. Um, Thank you. Thank you, first of all, for being on FaceTime with Todd Warden. Hey, um, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank yeah. you for asking. Sure.
it's been such an honor and and it's an honor to talk to you and everything that you're doing and uh hopefully i'll see you when i come out and um if there's anything i can do ever you already know oh, listen, you help me be you help me with all that techie stuff were you crazy or what <laughs> of course man that like i said at the end of the day sometimes it's about just putting out a hand and helping people out that's why i always tell people if you ever need me let me know and you never know what, what life well, is. I appreciate so, it. I say that. Thank you so kindly. And thanks for the show. We had, we had a great time. Thanks a lot, man. Of course, of course. We'll have it up tomorrow night. But until then, Jack, be safe, be well. You know, have a great night. Tell your wife I say hi. And we'll I'll do. talk to you soon. All right, brother? Take care, man. Be well. So first of all, I want to thank Jack for being such a great guest. And thank you for taking the time out from your schedule and being on FaceTime with Todd Warden. I love talking to you, man. I look forward to a long, great relationship with you as well. And uh, I think you're a great guy, a great actor. And congratulations on the project you're doing with the studio out in Nevada. I think it's a great selfless act. And I look forward to being there in a couple of years when you guys finally get to open up. And guys, thank you to my live virtual audience for always tuning in. Now you got to tune in tomorrow night because we have a great, great music legend coming on. You've seen him with Pink Floyd, with Toto, and Supertramp. My man Scott Page is going to be in the house tonight. Well, not tonight, but tomorrow night. <laughs> Let me scoop that. But guys, until then, have a great night. Be safe. And like I always say, if you're not living a passion in life, you lose like you live. Take care, everyone. Good night. Hey, guys. So while you're at the gym getting your workout on, you might as well subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's the best cool down in the world. Do you feel dizzy? Make it stop. Do you Make feel it stop. Dizzy?